Welcome back to What's New With Mead. We're in episode number 35, and I have BC from Doing the Most here to chat again. Um, he's back on episode 21 a long time ago, and we just finished a big mead competition yeah. and a million videos and stuff, so I figured <laughs> let's let's talk about everything that's happened since yeah. then. Yeah. So... We've been well, busy. We've, we're just talking about that. It's been, <laughs> been busy. It's been real busy. Yeah. So we have a couple things in front of us. I don't want to do the whole shtick of what are we drinking. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll kind of dive into a little bit, but we got three things in front of us, two pie mints and a peach mead. Okay. Did we confirm your recording over here? Okay, you are. <laughs> that always freaks me out. I, I've recorded <laughs> 10 minutes of footage before and then got around and was like, oh, the <laughs> camera's not on. Okay. So what do we have in front of us? So we got two pie mints. We've got one that's really young. This is one that I've just started. It's probably less than a month old. You've got your, uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what kind of pie mint you said this was. So this this is a blend of a Merlot that stalled uh-huh. and a Joe's Ancient Orange Mead oh, where yeah. I tried to do everything modern. Neither batch turned out good. So I blended all 10 gallons together and bottled it. Uh-huh. Every time I've opened a bottle, I've not enjoyed it, but I haven't opened one in over a year. Well, I'm curious. This is this is a peach mead. Uh, you said this is three and a half, something like that. Yeah, this is mid to early 2018. So this yeah. is August 2017. Okay, we're about five days shy of it being four years old. Wow. So quite some time. This better be really good. Uh, no promises. So that kind of brings us to the to the point of this mm. episode today. We're talking about mead stampede. Mm-hmm. Which is this big mead competition we just finished, um, and we, I kind of want to chat about the the good, the bad, the ugly, oh. all those things, and um, honestly, what we learned that will hopefully help you become a better mead maker. Okay, and then um, I want to use that to kind of talk about these, about our meads, okay. and you know, years you said three and a half years ago, you were a different mead maker back then. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. Four years ago, I was a brand new mead maker, and so um, I think it'd be great to kind of. I don't want to say roast our own meads, but maybe it might be helpful to roast maybe. a little bit. Maybe. We'll see. So um, let's first talk about, well, uh, let's do this. Let's, uh, we don't, we didn't have like a sipper. I didn't have like a good starting point for this. Yeah. I, I, we can dive in. <laughs> I don't want to dive in yet. I feel like I want to get a little further in. Let me, I got. I can pour something off fast. Oh, okay. How about this? How about a, a but is a beer going to throw the palate off? I don't know. I don't know either. I like beer. This is just a little homebrew. A little, uh, little beer uh, kit I made. Okay. Let's see if I don't even have to leave frame. I Look at just, this. You get to what a drink beer, host. beer You're out of a, out of a <laughs> tiny wine glass. <laughs> How excellent. Uh, this is this is what you get when you come over to the Man Made Mead Cave. It's such a hospitality. It's southern charm. You know, that's what I go for every day. I Boomer wake up sooner, and say, baby. I, I want. I want to be <laughs> charming. <laughs> this is a. a is this a beer for ants. <laughs> it's a hazy weed. <laughs> so, mm, it's so it's tiny. A little sipper. Oh, beer it's got kid. some pepper in there. Huh? Yeah. So, I uh, mean, it's like it's peppery. Yeah. What? What is that? What's contributing to that? It's just a wheat beer? Yeah. Whatever malt I must have used. I can't remember at the time what went into it. It just I made the kit, essentially. I didn't do anything else. I made the kit. Yeah, it tastes a little bit like um, like a green chili kind of flavor. Mm-hmm. Do you get that? Yeah. like a ro- There's like a roastiness, like a... Mm-hmm. There's a spice in there. I but like that. But not like pepper. I like that. I want a little bit more malt It might have been it, the... But... Maybe it was the hops I used. Maybe those hops oh. had some interesting mm-hmm. character. Mm-hmm. Well, it's nice. It's something to sip on. Something to start off with. Yeah, about four sips. <laughs> we got more. It's okay. <laughs> so, mean stampede. We did it. We did it. We survived it. More than anything. So, I, I want to first start off by saying uh, it was a lot more than I thought. Yeah. In, in uh, pretty much every way. More, more bottles than I thought we were going to get, yeah. for one. And then the whole experience of, like... Uh, the process was a lot. Mm-hmm. I mean, seeing... I, I, when you get shipped bottles, everybody goes, okay, yeah, of course you have to open them. But then right. we we got sent probably... <laughs> I don't know how many boxes you said. It was like 60-something, right? Yeah, probably... Probably just... but Not 70, but over 60. Yeah. 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 So... When I last count was 55, but then more came uh-huh. in. So... 
So we had up to almost whatever 65, 70 bottles mm-hmm. or uh, whatever boxes. Three hundred and ninety bottles. Open all those, of course. Then you have all your bottles. So then you take all your bottles and you make sure and put them together because you don't want to get those mixed up. Mm-hmm. Then you have to take the labels off. Yep. And most people, for the most part, were pretty good about not breaking the rules. Yeah. But there are some yeah. people who affix theirs on the uh, with like super glue, yeah. <laughs> like Krypton infused super glue, which is really tough to deal with. It was insane. So. But- yeah, so we had to like mark out and scrape and do all that for those. <laughs> yeah, we put a, a a label that would further make them anonymous, mm-hmm. and then of course put them into a style into their little style mm-hmm. zone. Four so, different categories. Four different categories. There's a lot of bottles. I just I can't get over how many bottles there were. Yeah, yeah. The the thing that was so intimidating to me once we had them all out and sorted and relabeled. Because we, we, we were in this Airbnb, <laughs> and so we just had them lining the the dining room mm-hmm. area in there. So it was like a dining room table just surrounded by a swamp of mead. And what was so intimidating was, like, the for one, the quantity, uh-huh. but then having no idea what was in these bottles. Yeah. Is it good? Is it bad? And we could always look and see vaguely <laughs> what it is, yeah. but... It's still nerve wracking, you know what I mean? Like it's a lot. It was intimidating. Yeah, yeah. I, I was a. Uh, although I will say it, there was there were very few, if almost no times where I was actually concerned about poison. There were Safety. some. Yeah, there's there's. Poison. Some, I mean, that's the best way to say. It. There was some that I was like, "This is not good," but I wasn't like, "This has some something in it that's gonna take me out." Yeah, yeah. No, I was never concerned about that, particularly. Uh, Rob had set my mind at ease. Rob mm-hmm. has done hundreds of competitions throughout his home brewing career, mm-hmm. either as a part of them or running them, and said there's never a concern about that. Yeah. And why would there be, honestly? I don't know. I, my I, mind goes lot, to on this. It's a lot to go through. <laughs> and they don't even know if it's going to get to you or I. We had yeah. a whole host of judges. Right. right. So, eh, I'm worried about that. I uh, I was very pleased, though, with with... Honestly, how many great ones we had. There was, mm-hmm. of course, there were some that were not so great, but and we'll talk about <laughs> about, that, about that today. It kind of the yeah um, retro retrospective side of it all. <laughs> retrospective. Yeah. I feel like it should be like black and white and old timey and have like a mustache. Oh man, you're really uh, thinking I'm going to put a lot of work <laughs> a lot of effort into this podcast. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, there was. It was interesting, I will say, like, the breadth of different styles Mm -hmm. and the the bell curve of of execution. Yeah. There were a lot that were in the middle. Uh Uh-huh. And I felt really good about that. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. If it was more weighted toward the low end of the spectrum, I I think that would have had me questioning my palate, honestly. Yeah, I... I definitely think it also was so dependent on style, too. Because, mm-hmm. like, traditionals, we had... I wouldn't say that there was even a bell curve. It was, like, there's little peaks and valleys. Because, <laughs> yeah, yeah. like, traditionals are so hard to make. And so there are some that were fantastic, but... We didn't have that many. We didn't have... We like had, like, 17? Like, yeah. Something we, like that? That was... Was that the lowest? Yeah, by far. And yeah. that was even lower than experimental, which I thought experimental yeah. would be... Low. But I guess a lot of people lumped things into experimental, probably. Yeah, yeah, it's hard because like if it doesn't, it doesn't feel like it fits a category. You yeah. kind of shuffle it into experimental. Like in Valkyrie's Horn, I'm entering my smoked sizer, mm. right? But I don't feel like it fits in the sizer category mm-hmm. because it's there's so much more that happened to it, so it's going to end up in experimental. And... Yeah, it's true. And well, what I was trying to get at is that. That traditional is super hard, so there mm-hmm. was, you know, it's kind of wish-washy. But the mellow mel category, I feel like that's where that bell curve really hit. Yeah. We yeah. had some fantastic ones, you know, 40s yeah. and above. But for the most part, they that bell curve in the center, that probably 32 to 40 range was pretty mm-hmm. pretty uh, big. We had a lot of people yeah, hitting wide. that. Yeah. 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 So, uh, and then experimental, I can't remember exactly because that was also hit or miss some people made some very, very interesting very ones. hit or miss yeah i don't know that that I, there were some good ones though did you try the one with old bay seasoning and worcestershire mm. and Tabasco? no i remember you guys sitting across the room trying it yeah though. yeah i i i had the opportunity to try that one 
Uh, definitely experimental. There were the fun thing about that. That to me was uh, doing it in the same room ish. Was like, yeah. Every once in a while, we'd have one where it's like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And then like you know, you go walk around and you pour some. Yeah. And then sometimes it was like, oh my gosh, this one's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. Try this. Anyone want to try this? This one? smells like poop. Try <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. I feel like we should like have a bell we ring next time. <laughs> like, hey, come over and get a sip. Yeah. Yeah, there was there was definitely a a a wide variation uh-huh. in uh, in in creativity, creative spark. <laughs> <laughs> when we so when we got the the best of shows kind of narrowed down, which mm-hmm. for anyone curious, what we did was traditional category. We were all judging traditionals at that same time. Mm-hmm. We went, everyone tasted not every bottle, but you had a little sector of of means that you had. And then you did a, you, you chose them for the best of show. We took about six, four, uh, maybe five to the best of show for traditionals, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, which then meant that we basically, everybody taste tested the five that we had handpicked to say, these are the best of the traditionals. And mm-hmm. then we, we decided from there, which one was actually the best and so on and so forth, like mm-hmm. one, two, three, mm-hmm. um, and did that. The, we did that with the Mellow Mouse, which was a lot more aggressive i would say because yeah. there were more of them and they were better yeah yeah it the the bright line between the top like five to ten mm-hmm. was so narrow yeah. that it was it was difficult to to make those arguments we had to in, in my little group we had um i think we had sent maybe eight tried to send eight to best of show <laughs> in our own world because there were just so many good ones yeah and, and y- so, y'all had a streak of good ones yeah we had a yeah. bunch of really good ones and so david and i had to actually do a mini best of show to <laughs> narrow down and say like okay yeah. hold on let's readjust like which of these do we actually need to send yeah and so we've got it down to like maybe five at that point yeah did but, you do any of that along the way either where you like send one as a consideration for best of show and then you have something that's like the, redact, a little like bit better, back. and you're like, yeah, actually, it's a, we didn't. No, we just kind of, um, no, we just kept throwing them out, and then we kind of knew yeah. though we'd have to pare it down. So I think we we ran with that. There were at least with Jake and I, there were a few that we called back. Mm-hmm. Ah, actually, that braggart isn't as good as we thought it was. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So um, after uh, you know, best of show, we did all the for each category, and then the final final best of show being the what's the best mead here mm-hmm. was the first place for each category so there's four mm-hmm. meads in total and that one was even more <laughs> aggressive to say the least because <laughs> yeah. the, we, we got down to the top two mm-hmm. and that's where things kind of hit the fan because we had seven people did we have yeah something like that i think there were seven maybe eight yeah yeah it was and so we were all judging and the, it became like a split in a way. It was like that movie, 12 Angry Men, where you have like one outsider who's trying to like argue everybody to get on their side. Uh-huh. We had two that were very firmly in one camp and the rest of us were like, yeah. Yeah, it and, was. But that's the thing is like, even talking about those meads, the one was a traditional and one was a mellow male. And mm-hmm. so one of the big things that we kind of talked about in that was um, execution. Kind of mm-hmm. rooting back to what you said, there was a, a, a vast amount of difference in execution. Mm-hmm. And both of them were executed amazingly. Beautifully. Yeah. So that that's probably what was hardest about it. But we ended up debating for a while, came to the consensus. Um, and yeah. uh, I feel like you and I were on the same page throughout mm-hmm. that process. Where we were like, but really, this one is better executed. Yeah. And, and it's tough because you and I are doing this so much. Several of our other judges have been mead makers uh-huh. or do make some mead. Uh, one is a budding sommelier. And so, like, there's various experience levels with this. But for you and I, who are so, like, keenly focused on achieving honey profile uh-huh. and maintaining honey profile, I felt like you and I kept looking at each other like, there's a clear winner. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which, at that, the problem with that is... It only comes from experience. The understanding of how difficult that is only yeah. comes with the experience of like, hey, I've tried to make a traditional mead, mm-hmm. and this is what happened. Yeah. And really, I think what we found out was the um, our best of show was actually probably a show mead from the way he described yeah. it. He, yeah, it was. So there was. I mean, I even, think he may have used a little bit of um, nutrient. Oh, he did okay. But I, there was no acid or tannin amendment. Yeah, yeah. 
So for the most part, it was a show me to, yeah. to some extent. If you consider nutrients, you know that's a, a debate. It's debatable, <laughs> yeah, debatable. But yeah, I would call it a show me. Yeah, for all intents and purposes. So that's what was also impressive. We it's, didn't know at the time though. We didn't know that that was post giving the call right. to him and saying, "Hey, what did you do here?" And then he <laughs> described it. So yeah. But all in all, um, I think the big things I learned coming out of this is that. Uh, we you've talked about balance before on your channel. Yeah. You know, you have a whole video talking about how to balance mm-hmm. your bruise, and um, it's something that I've been working on, trying to to work on balancing. Um, I noticed that a majority of people didn't have a good balance between yeah. acid, between tannin, between sweetness, mm-hmm. and um, of course, there's other things you can dive into. And I feel like they they all kind of get into yeah. their own world. But I noticed a huge. Uh, Mm-hmm. lack i don't know a better <laughs> word of uh understanding on how to balance a brew yeah a deficit yes yeah which is the thing that through practice you can improve mm-hmm. rapidly right with practice but yeah uh i was i don't want to say alarmed because that sounds like really intense but i was kind of baffled by the number of overly acidic meads we had yeah. where it was really like sweeten it up just another 10 points or so mm-hmm. and it's probably going to balance back out and that for me it was just kind of like are they drinking this and saying this is this is great mm. or did they like some people send it in because they're like i don't know what to do here yeah. to to get it to that next level so in judging that it's difficult because you're like i don't know what the intent of this was i don't right. know what the purpose here was and so fortunately we had the space to just be as honest as we wanted with all of our and I, I think we were uh honest and all the feedback we received was i didn't hear of anybody who was distraught necessarily mm-hmm. by um by what we said, you know, no. and I'm sure there's some people who didn't like hearing. <laughs> and if you're offended by what we said, our goal is not to offend you. You know, we're a blind palate in a way, um, blind to who you are, I should say. So yeah. Yeah. we couldn't really take feelings into account. <laughs> <laughs> as much as we maybe wanted yeah, to. <laughs> maybe I, I wanted to be, you know, I want to be honest and, and make people feel appreciated and yeah. thankful for everybody sending stuff in. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to be like not real yeah and i will say there were only a couple maybe two to four that i had all weekend where Uh i was like this is a straight dumper yeah for the most part there you know if i had been given a bottle of it by a friend Mm -hmm. i would probably like put a little cane sugar in there and sweeten it (laughs) up and like there were things that could be done even in the glass to to make them drinkable and so I was really proud of the community for that, that mm-hmm. there were not a whole lot where I was like, oh, this is just terrible. Right. No, I agree. I think um, that, like I said, we only had a couple in there. Mm-hmm. And uh, oh, one other thing I was going to mention that was very interesting to me, of course, balance. But then I don't know if you felt this way, but the difference between aroma and flavor, <laughs> yeah. there were some of them that I was like, this thing smells like yeah. it's incredible or this thing smells awful. And then you taste it and it's, the complete opposite. It smells like we had one that smelled like f- straight up flowers and like this beautiful oh, man. like aroma. Oh my gosh. It perfumed the whole dining yeah. room. It was, it was gorgeous. And then I tasted it and it was like, what the heck happened yeah. here? It was just kind of average. It was, it was so weird. And so there's... It's whiplash. Yeah. It's, yeah. And I, I don't really know. I haven't dove too far into the aroma side of brewing. Obviously, you could probably go deep with that. I'm more about the taste yeah of it. right right but i do i do want to understand what the heck happened you know like i would love to do some yeah research and that one out. in particular was a really stark example of that uh-huh but you know we also had ones where i'd smell it and be like oh this smells like acetone uh-huh and then you drink it and it's like oh this isn't that bad yeah and it, that was like a whiplash feeling too to be like this is to smell it and think I don't know if I can even drink this. And right. then drink it and be like, oh, this is fine. It's very strange. It was, there was a lot, there, I won't say a lot, there were some of those and yeah. that really threw me off. Yeah. But well, let's go ahead and do this. Let's go ahead and dive, let's go to mine first. Because okay. I think. So we're I, going to the peach first. We're going to the peach first. So I, I'm pulling this out, one, because it's kind of fun to uh, get to bring something out that's old. I love it. This is my, I think, second meat I ever made. 
Um, I made a, a big batch or a three gallon batch of traditional mead, and then I split it into. Look at that label. I know that's that's when I was printing on those little uh, <laughs> washable ones. Yeah, and uh, I split a three gallon batch, put three pounds of peaches in. I think I used like K one V one. I can't remember what I did, but this is not this is pre me understanding back sweetening, and pre me understanding honestly balance mm-hmm. so there's no acid adjustment there's no tannin adjustment it's just so tell me do you remember what you did to the peaches um i just cut them up and i just threw them right in i didn't really even peels and all peels and all okay yeah so let's like i said i didn't really know much about even fruit additions at that point so mm-hmm. this is open critique <laughs> the the internet tells me that all you have to do to to, to enjoy a bad meat is to wait it out We'll all it, this all it needs years. is time. Four years is a long time to wait for. Well, and, and most fruited things mm-hmm. that are not grapes peak at about two years. So mm-hmm. it smells great. It it's does got smell like, very bright, very very. It's got big sherry notes. Uh huh. You know, it's. I, I don't want to say that it was oxidized, but this is an example of uh, one of those smellers and then tasters. Is it? No, the sherry notes are really. It's almost nutty. Mm-hmm. There's like a pecan kind of praline Interesting, thing yeah. happening in the, I mean it's like a sherry like something that's been you know like like an additive process where they they drain the barrel a little uh, bit yeah. put a little bit more in there no the nose on this is phenomenal mm-hmm. I hate that you're setting me up to not like I'm sorry <laughs> I, I just I'm also extra critical of mine so mm. mm-hmm you're ooh it might be past his prime. You're right. That's a. <laughs> yeah, to the whiplash. N- the nose yeah. is, is so nice, but then it's it's got some sourness to it. It's like um, it's very sour, very sour, and it's almost un- unripe peach. What's mm-hmm. weird is the nose to me is presenting like more ripe ish peach, more ripe mm-hmm. fruit, and then the, the actual taste of it is like unripe. I don't know what happened there, but. Yeah, the nose is so wonderful. I do wonder, speaking to to this, you know, knowing that this is four years old and I didn't do anything to it, I think that a great fix for this, something like that, would be some more honey, sweeten it up a little Mm -hmm. bit because Mm -hmm. it it, it would uh, counterbalance the tartness that we're getting, Mm -hmm. but it would also bring up more of that peach flavor, I feel like. Yeah. Because we're getting dry peach, which, uh, or unsweet peach, which would be arguably pretty gross Mm -hmm. then the the acid balance is too high so trying to after sweetness trying to balance with some tannic maybe and so all the acid in here came from the peaches Mm -hmm. what yeast did you use i think this was the k1v1 i think this is what i used at the time i mean it almost tastes soured yeah like it it tastes like lactic acid more than it does i don't know what's in a peach citric malic tartaric probably that's a good question um but it's not buttery in the way that I want it to be mm-hmm. either. Because if it was buttery like a sherry or a chardonnay with some sweetness, like this could be this could be really nice. But I don't know. I almost want to put a little simple syrup in here and see yeah. what would happen if it was sweeter. I think you're right that that would help balance it out. I, I do think it needs a little bit of tannin. Mm-hmm. Something to give it a little grip or something to claw into a little bit. It's very watery. Mm-hmm. And I want it to hang around a little bit longer because all I'm experiencing is the acid. Mm, yeah. And I think if it had a little bit more grip, once the acid washes away, you would pick up some of those fruit yeah. flavors and fruit skin kind of notes. So what would you do for tannic value here? Would you oak it? Would you use cubes, chips? You know, talking about tannic? that buttery thing, maybe I would oak it like you would mm-hmm. a Chardonnay like a, with an American oak or Hungarian oak, get a little bit of vanillins in there. Uh-huh. So it's something that's smooths out that peach, but also you get a little bit of that tannin. That's like not a super identifiable tannin. You're like, mm, I yeah, think this might've been oaked, uh, but something just to give it a little bit of, of, of grip. It definitely needs to be sweeter. On that note for anyone who might be new to oaking, Mm-hmm. Do you have any suggestion on how you start oaking? Like, what what's a good first step? I think you buy a five-gallon barrel. <laughs> <laughs> you just go for it. And you just go 
all in. <laughs> and, you know, you, you plant a bunch of oak trees. <laughs> you, <laughs> this is a 20-year process. It's a, it takes a while. <laughs> but really, it's the best introductory way to get into it. Um, you know, I like to recommend oak chips because yeah. I'm, I'm a simpleton. And they're easy to add. They mm-hmm. work quickly. So you can get your oaking done really fast. Uh, they don't give you that stratification of oak flavor that like connoisseurs of of oaked chardonnays or or bourbons mm-hmm. or Irish whiskeys uh, or brandy connoisseurs really like. And it's hard for me to suggest something I don't really work with. Right. Yeah. But my community is all about uh, using oak cubes. Mm-hmm. Because you get that kind of stratification of of toast down to less toast and less toast, and so it's more like aging in a barrel where it would age or it would kind of seep out. Right? Okay, uh, but for a beginner who's just wanting to like get a feel for how to oak things in a five gallon batch, mm-hmm. four six ounces of dark toast oak chips for a week to two weeks. And, yeah. and you've got your oak character. You don't right. have to wait four or five months for a spiral or a stave or whatever to, to work its way That's out. I was uh, I was on the, the, the spiral train for a while. And, <laughs> Were um, you? <laughs> well, I, here's the thing. I didn't understand. I didn't know about them until I started to use them more. And what I kind of found is that they, compared to my experience with cubes mm-hmm. and chips, they took longer. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't always pleased with the character I was getting out of them. Hmm. I would get, I would get some woodiness, some some oak side that really would uh, enhance some flavors, but I just never felt satisfied with it. Yeah. So I don't know if I was maybe not using enough at the time, but uh, I I do think I'm gonna do more experimentation. But cubes are my are my next real thing to jump into. Yeah. Um, I like the idea of of spiral. Uh, excuse me, of chips. Mm-hmm. Um. And of course, barreling, barrel aging, but I can't do that in here. There's not enough room. Yeah. So yeah, I have one five gallon barrel, and it takes up a significant amount of floor space. And you can't, you can't just let it be. <laughs> like when it's empty, you have to go and fill it up. Otherwise, right. you're getting yourself in trouble. And so it's a, uh, it is like having a pet. I would yeah, think. you're you're reminding me that I need to brew a batch to go in my <laughs> barrel now. I'm just thinking about that. I have a. I, so in there right now is a, a barley wine okay. that I'm going to bottle as the holidays approach. So that way it's carbonated in time for Christmas. But that means that I probably need to get my brew for that started now. Mm, so yeah. it's relatively clear when it goes in. And I think I'm going to do a blueberry acer blend. Hey, that yeah. sounds great. Corey suggested it. and uh, I've always wanted to do one of those. I think it'd be interesting. It feels right. It yeah. feels right for an oak barrel. But I don't know. I, I, think, <laughs> I think a big... And I hate to put more on your plate, but a big oak <laughs> test yeah. where you're doing, you know, six different kinds of oak. Maybe mm-hmm. it's uh, chips and cubes and staves mm-hmm. if you're off of spirals at this point. And, you know, three of them are dark toast and three of them are light toast. Oh, yeah. So you can kind of really get an idea for the character. It could mm-hmm. be really interesting. That's actually, I want to do something like that. And and I tried to reach out to L.D. Carlson and went to the homebrew shop and went and just tried to get the same oak in a different form and my problem is uh, as i talked to the brew shop lady mm-hmm. she told me that gail gail who yes. is phenomenal yeah hi gail <laughs> um <laughs> she told me that like the cubes only come in Hungar- hungarian and then like one other variety mm-hmm. and then like the chips only come in american and this one thing and this one thing. so like they're kind of exclusive in some in what they provide so if, if anybody can get me like the same oak in different varieties, I guess I could do it myself and just I'm telling you, we go out to Arcadia to Anna's grandparents' land. We find an oak tree, we cut it down. We could be making barrels. We can make your new table in here. Man, the sky's the limit. <laughs> it's all oak all the way down. Has to happen now. That's... All right, are we gonna move on? We're moving on from this. So my my whole purpose of that four years uh, age is not everything for one. <laughs> execution is everything and so yeah. there are ways to have fixed this early mm-hmm. on that would have helped it age better mm-hmm. you know balancing the acid giving it tannic value and back sweetening a hair probably would have helped let me say this though for your second meat ever it's not that bad it's, this could be 
so much worse (laughs) based on my recent experience tasting meats uh this isn't that bad it's just it's overly tart yeah and and we've had some tart meats here (laughs) so are we moving on to mine let's go do you want to go on to yours yeah look at this funky bottle yeah that is a look 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 at my label (laughs) it's been through a couple of wars yeah (laughs) yeah it looks like it dug it up out of the backyard did you bury this? Is that what happened? <laughs> yeah, it's it's a specific type of aging. Oh. It relies on the the gyrations of the tectonic plates in order to really in Oklahoma. In, <laughs> infuse the flavors. Yeah, when they stopped fracking, it oh, really okay. impacted the quality of my mead. <laughs> um, what so is this? This was so is, this was two meads. This was two five gallon batches uh-huh. uh, that neither of which I loved. Mm-hmm. So there was a uh, Joe's Ancient Orange Mead where I tried to do. It not the ancient way, okay. which I have since learned that you're supposed to you're supposed to just follow the recipe and not deviate. That's what the internet says. So it calls for bread yeast. It calls for like big chunks of oranges, and I did a champagne yeast, and I used my zester to zest all the oranges. It turned out freaking awful. <laughs> and then the other thing was a merlot kit. All I was trying to do was make a merlot. Yeah. Right. And I went through probably about a year's worth of three or four different wine kits where they all stalled out. Mm-hmm. And it, I was doing nothing different than I would do like with meat. I was using nutrient. Hmm. I had good ambient temperatures. I was using aggressive wine yeasts. But they all stalled out sweet. So this Merlot stalled out really <laughs> sweet. So my fix was to take the two bad batches uh-huh. and blend them together. And then bottle all of that. And that was about three, three and a half years ago. And so here it is now. It is Merlot. And Joe's. Your comment, so your comment on Joe's, the ancient, or the, the modern technique. Mm-hmm. I did this. I pulled this bottle just right now. This was from a Joe's, my Joe's ancient orange, orange I made. I made a bread yeast version, followed the recipe. Well, let's say, let's say this. I made the recipe, but substituted out wine yeast for bread yeast but did like an A B test. Okay. Essentially. How'd it go? Well, what I the Well the, <laughs> the thing that I found out, everybody always talks about bread yeast using it. I think because it theoretically caps out earlier, uh-huh. providing sweetness, uh-huh. they both fermented out completely. So uh-huh. like the the idea that the bread yeast would retain sweetness was kind of null. Yeah. I mean it just it, Okay. So um I can't remember my exact tasting notes on it because it's been, uh, this was 2018, December 2018. So it's been a couple of years now, but okay. it, uh, I was not impressed by either one. It could have been my performance of it, but I didn't think that there was a massive insane difference between the two. So, okay. but I'm curious to see your mix. I've never had a Joe's ancient orange that I've loved. I, I, I'm very tempted. I've already, I'm very tempted to open it maybe after and okay. maybe taste. I, I'm not a believer in Joe's. At this point, but I there are people who love it. This is very um. Ooh, the the front the front taste was really nice, and then it, it kind of. <laughs> it's been about a year since I've had this. It's got some like vanilla e like um soft. I may have oaked it. I don't remember. Mm. Yeah, the initial. I really like that initial. Bite. But the development, the flavor is developing in, in a kind of odd way. It's opening up. I'm trying to figure out. It's very muted. It's not as expressive as I want it to be. At the very end, if you wait and wait and wait, a little bit of that orange zest comes out. Yeah. But it's like pithy. Mm-hmm. Like when, like when you were a kid, did you ever uh, peel an orange bike? biting into mm. it first and then you peel it yeah and you kind Ooh. of have that <laughs> flavor on your teeth for a yeah. little while afterward it's that kind of flavor but it's like way in the back and way after you swallow the, i will say the flavor develops through this which is not always true of, of meads and, and wines is a lot or sometimes they're flat and they just kind of they fall off real fast mm-hmm. you know you get flavor and then it's gone this one kind of has a little roller coaster of flavor yeah, this needs a lot more tannin to support that Merlot grape. And my guess is that what happened in blending them is that all the tannin that was in the Merlot mm-hmm. got diluted by half. Yeah. And so 
now it feels weaker on the tannin profile. I think the sweetness is okay, though. I like the sweetness. I like the acid balance, honestly. I think it's it's not hitting me super hard, which mm-hmm. is nice. Um, but that that is... Uh, th- that's that acid, though. That is what we're getting with that. You know, it's not as... Well, I, should, I say that. There is citric acid coming from Joe's. <laughs> it's just not as strong yeah. as the malic. Or, sorry, tartaric acid. Yeah, yeah, um, the tartaric and the, and the merlot. This is the best bottle of this I've opened yet. I was gonna say it's not. You were you were saying it's pretty bad. I think it's I think it's pretty good. I mean, it's it's drinkable. Definitely drinkable. It's drinkable. The development's really interesting to me. Mm-hmm. That's, I would hold some more bottles. See what happens. Maybe. I think I've got three bottles left. I've used several for cooking. Mm-hmm. Like I'll take out a bottle and deglaze a pan with it or yeah. something. Because it's like, what am I going to do with all this bad mead, right? And so I've whittled away at it, mostly by cooking over the last few what if, years. What if this was the one, and you just you know. just didn't give it the time it needed? That's part of the recipe recommendation, is <laughs> allow to age for three to four years. <laughs> I don't know if I can get away with that. It's really... The clarity is, is nice. Uh-huh. <laughs> so there's that. I, I do wonder if you oaked it, because it does have some... Uh, which A lot of those Merlot kits come with oak chips. So, or oak powder. So mm-hmm. I might have used... Or like granulated oak? Mm-hmm. I might have used that. Mm. It's so long ago. And I take bad notes as it is. So... Well, I'm... Definitely keep this one. I do want... This one's very young. This is... Yeah. Considerably younger. I and what, what's the grape in this one? This is a Cab Sav. Uh, okay. And it's the Cab Sav kit with blueberry honey. Okay. So... Main bees blueberry? Mm, yeah, actually... Excellent. Shout out to John. <laughs> Shout out to John. <laughs> Mentioned doing the most for a discount. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, I, I'm just curious what you think. This is a... I'm not usually a big fan of cab sabs. If I am, I want them to be really tannic. Like, I want to feel like it won't let go. This one won't let go, but it's not... It's because it's uh, still... <laughs> It's young. It's fermented out. It's just not dropped. I need to rack it so I can actually have a chance to, to drop more. Yeah, there's some there's some of that yeasty breadiness on mm-hmm. on the nose for it's sure. Definitely sweet. But I mean, you can see it. It's it's cloudy as. But having this out. makes me realize that well, not realize, makes me want to do more of these because I think given age and a time to really just mature, this thing will open up and then flavors will start to meld more. Uh, and I have mm. the actually have the regular a- cab sav dry just wine in there too, mm-hmm. and so I've it tasted both of them. And- so what was your process on this? This is jammy. Mm-hmm. Like it's not bad grippy. It's but the grippiness comes from that jamminess. Like it clings around like you're eating like grape jam. It uh I I used the whole what was it? I'm trying to think the the wine kit I had that was two gallons of juice okay so i did one gallon of juice um and then i filled up water to three gallons and then i added maybe 12 pounds of honey on top of that not maybe 12 i don't think 12 i gotta remember now it was like maybe nine i think i did three okay. pounds per so it was very high yeah um, it's high grass. It started at like 11 30 dang which i was fine with because i wanted it to end sweet Gotcha. So. Gotcha. And I used uh, D47 on this guy. One of my faves. So. Um, it's not bad. It's, I think, are when you, things drop out. Are you going to oak it? It has granulated oak in it, mm-hmm. and there are oak chips with the, or, oak, yeah, oak chips with the kit. I do think I want to oak it more, because it needs some extra, mm-hmm. um, I just don't know if I'll use the oak chips provided, or if Got I'll it. choose something else. So. I don't know. That's I mean, for it being so young, it's not bad. It's not bad. It's, not I, bad. it's I better than this. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> That's not true at all. <laughs> Maybe not the nose on it, but I like how I like how I mean this. The wonderful thing about this is it highlights the grape and it highlights the honey. Yeah. In a way that I feel like the Merlot grape in here is kind of a, a supporting cast member. Mm. It's not front and center. I agree. I, uh, I want to switch gears a little bit. Okay. So we talked about Mead Stampede. And if you're not, if you didn't participate this past year, uh, we are going to do it again. Our plan, our hope is to do it again. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> Hopefully not first. <laughs> <laughs> um, our plan is to do it again. Yeah, All things, so. if, if things go well, we can hopefully be able to do um, 
even more with it if we're our goal kind of talked about maybe with barring COVID doesn't kick up again that we might be able to do something for like an awards ceremony Mm -hmm. and people actually show up and get to chat now we we wouldn't do like a live judging situation it's not like the state fair (laughs) or even that nope so um but there's a chance to to do that Mm -hmm. Uh, at the very least we're going to try and host it if we can't do in person do it virtually again Mm -hmm. and uh it's a great way to get your meads judged whether you're confident or or not, it's a good way for you to receive feedback, which I think is super important for mm-hmm. any brewer. Yeah. Um, I think that had I sent more stuff in, I think my progression as a meme maker would have gone faster. Because I would have had yeah. real, not real people, but people who didn't really care about me as much tasting my stuff and just giving me honest feedback. That's a piece of advice I would give to folks watching this is as you are brewing, particularly if you're brewing big batches, like three, five gallon batches, and you you really have either something you want feedback on or something that you feel like you have hit a home run mm-hmm. on this, be intentional about putting some small bottles back for competition purposes. That's a thing that I've never done. Mm-hmm. I have always bottled in big old 750 mil bottles, but... I want to get more feedback on my stuff too. Mm-hmm. So over the last year, as I'm getting ready to bottle stuff I'm really happy with, I've had to go, wait, time to run to the brew shop and get some small bottles, some little 375s. Mm-hmm. So that way I have competition bottles put aside in the event that I want to want to enter something. And so that's it's important to know because most competitions ask you for three to four bottles. Yeah. And so you have to be intentional about having three to four small bottles set aside. I just realized, so my, my peppermint mead, I um, I was like, man, it'd be so cool to send that into the, the Mazer Cup and just like submit. Well, I only bottled <laughs> 750s. Yeah. And I was like, oh crap. So um, I guess theoretically I could risk it and try and move them over, but I don't really want to oxygenate. Yeah. So to that point, it, when you bottle things, just always, be mindful. yeah, just bottle some small bottles, mm-hmm. whether that's for sharing or if it's something you're like, I might send it away yeah. to a, a competition. It might be worth it. All right. So we're back. <laughs> we're we back. Took a, we took a short break that you didn't see. Yeah. Um, I had to go do some laps. Yeah. I had to do a quick lap. This is uh, a Joe's ancient orange <laughs> that, uh, that's got a nose on it, man. Yeah. So, this one does have a label. Um, here's my thing. I, I briefly talked about the um, wine, the wine yeast versus bread yeast. I can't remember what I did, but I, I either bottled them both separately, but used the same label, or I blended them and then bottled it. <laughs> Regardless, it says wine yeast. I don't have any bottles that say bread yeast. So, I don't know... Okay. I, th- I couldn't do like an AB at this point, is what I'm saying. Got it. Without opening all these bottles. So. To be like, oh, this one tastes like bread. Yeah. This one's very, very nosy. It's very fragrant. Uh, how old is this? Uh, that one's December 2018. 2018. Wow. Mm-hmm. It smells younger than that. Yeah. This has a an aroma that I don't like. I'm so, having trouble identifying. Yeah, I, uh... uh it's brown I, sugar. It smells like brown mm-hmm. sugar. Yeah, okay. There's like a molasses, sorghum kind of... Huh. I had to put that... That's interesting. It, it just, it like reminds me of my younger days where I was like brewing stuff as cheap as possible. <laughs> and so if brown sugar was on sale, that's what I was fermenting that week. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm curious what your, uh is for it it's very uh, is that the new air flip shelf <laughs> sponsor <laughs> i just i forgot that this was chilled yeah so it's like oh this sucks it's uh it's it's very ah, it's, hot and very um spice heavy it's pithy mm-hmm. like it grabs you right underneath there i don't want to up uh upset the mead community but i have people ask me all the time recipes to make mm-hmm. and I, I did a review of this one, and I, I in my review, I kind of said, this is a recipe that hmm. is okay to experience, but I would not 
I don't put this out as a top top ten recipes you have to make in the mead world. Why do you think this recipe is so popular? Because it's got an acronym. Mm. I mean, I think that's the the biggest thing. Is like again, I've never it, had an example got the of word it. Ancient in it. Mm. You know what I mean? And the people are like, "Well, Vikings." That's mysterious, yeah. I've never had an example of Joe's Ancient Orange Mead that I thought was good. But there are people, especially on my Discord, that just rave about it. I, I and no I almost doubt. want them to send me a bottle so yeah. I can understand what it is they're tasting. I we're, we're gonna. I want to talk about that in a second. I want to talk about. Um, I'll call it a dilemma. That's a dilemma, in my opinion. But kind of going back to what you're saying here. <laughs> we'll get there. Don't worry. Um, this recipe, I just. I w- I'm not been super enthused by it. And maybe I just haven't executed it well enough. I'm sure somebody's typing down in the comments saying that I, I haven't executed a Joe's Ancient Orange the right way. But isn't it supposed to be foolproof, though? Like, isn't that part of the selling point? My biggest, one of my biggest beefs with it was that the bread yeast, in my case, maybe I got super strong bread yeast for whatever reason, ferment through everything. And this thing has like three and a half pounds of honey. <laughs> so. It was starting at like well, like eleven twenty or something like that. So mm-hmm. you'd think that you'd cap out bread yeast at some point, but again, maybe I had the super soldiers of bread yeast in my in my Fleischmanns. See, it's so thin, and that pithiness is just it. It lingers and yeah. lingers. Um, and I I see that you had raisins in here, which the original recipe calls for. Mm-hmm. And there's cinnamon, yep. and cinnamon, clove, cinnamon orange. sticks, so there should be more tannin in there. Mm-hmm. You would think from all those different things, and it's just not. It's not that. I will say it is. It is a recipe that is very pretty to watch, because yeah. the carboy you put it in the carboy. Looks like Christmas. It, it looks yeah, it looks pretty, and so I think uh, there's a lot of people who might brew and see something. And I'm. Uh, I see stuff all the time where I'm like, that looks cool. Like, I want to do it. Like, <laughs> yeah. butterfly pea blossoms. Like, that is a cool color to mm-hmm. get. Mm-hmm. That doesn't always mean it's like, great. It just looks, looks cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I wanted to talk about, you, you mentioned there are people probably brewing this who are raving about it. Yeah. This could go for the Joe's Ancient Orange or a personal recipe or... What braise, are, braise you know, one month mead. People rave about it. Yeah. I've never had it, so I can't comment on it. But I, people I rave about it. it. Mm-hmm. But and I guess my my beef with that is that I feel like a lot of those people are living in their own little bubble, and if mm. you only ever taste test your own mead, um, you're what a, a Tony calls it cellar tongue. I think is what he called it. Oh uh, yeah. And so that's where you're just like taste testing like. Uh, his, a cellar tongue something different, but he equated it to that. To yeah, you're like only condition tasting, your palate. Yeah. Yeah. You're only tasting your own things, so you don't have any reference. for Right. Like, if you raised a baby only ever eating blue cheese, mm-hmm. and then gave them some, like, Kraft Easy Mac, they'd be like, this isn't cheese, what is this? Right. But most babies would be like, I love Kraft Dinner, yeah. you know? And so, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Uh, I... I do you ever have like imposter syndrome where like you taste yourself like your peppermint? Mm-hmm. You know, for me it would be like my Acerglin recipe yeah. where you're like this is the bee's knees, uh-huh. and then you pour a glass for somebody and you have that like sinking feeling like what if they don't like it? <laughs> oh yeah, all the time. <laughs> that is like, yeah. And I think uh, most of the time it happens with people like this. Going to sound bad, but it never happens with you because I'm like, I, I know you're gonna you're gonna say whatever you want yeah. it's like people who because you've taken well, I, I should say this you've tasted some stuff that i made that actually is good that uh-huh. is like turned out to be a good recipe yeah. whereas like sometimes i take stuff over to people who may not have tasted my stuff and then realize oh well what if they don't like it you yeah know? and then you're misrepresenting um mead so there are people i feel like who are only tasting their stuff and then they're mm. On that same vein, if you're only ever giving your stuff to your mom or your dad or your sister or, you know, somebody who loves you unconditionally yeah, or just wants free booze, most people don't say stuff Mm -mm. to to be like, hey, this isn't good. Yeah. And that's not saying that your stuff you're making is not good. But what it is saying is that 
real feedback unbiased unbiased feedback, feedback yeah. is critical yeah and it can actually come from friends you can have great friends who are who are just open and honest and will tell you like hey this is this is good or hey this has a weird taste to it mm-hmm. they might not be able to to define and say that oh that's a fusel of acetone i'm hinting in there mm-hmm. but they can give a uh <laughs> so oh. I, I just want to sweeten oh. it up a little bit and yeah. see what happens um, no, you make a good point. When I bring people over to 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 stand in on my taste tests for for whatever recipe, I try to always say, "You're under no obligation to like this." Yeah, like say what you want to say about it because I think it is it's important for them to feel comforted from the outset that like okay, it's okay mm-hmm. if I don't like this. I can just say if I don't, that I don't like this, but. Especially as a new brewer, there. Let me backtrack. There's there's already a perception that homebrew is bad. Yeah. You know, for people who aren't homebrewers, they're like, oh, that guy's Which, brewing in his garage. I I mean I I'll say I kind of thought of that <laughs> previously too. I was like, yeah. man, I just why would you go and brew it yourself when you could just go get the good stuff? Mm-hmm. But that was a pre understanding, honestly, how. Uh, not easy it can be, but mm-hmm. how, how much money you can save <laughs> and uh, how fun yeah. it can be. So, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. I lost my point there somewhere along Sorry. the way, but <laughs> I, I got, got you. But like, it's it's important to to let people know that their feedback can be can be whatever they want it to be. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I mean, you're making stuff in your house. You're making stuff. You're proud of it because mm-hmm. you made it. Not only did you like make it, but it it did what it was supposed to do. Maybe it dropped really clear. Yeah. Maybe you have cool wax seals or shrink wraps on your bottle. So like yeah. the whole thing, especially your first batch, you're like, I am proud of, <laughs> of this. Try it. And the, so like that 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 pressure is on right. for them to be like, it's so good. You That's, know. And and I think <laughs> if I of course the stuff I made in the beginning I I gave to people and I um. Having people, if I had people around me that would have been really blunt and honest, it would have been nice. Yeah. But there's also still a part of you, you have a hill to overcome to be like, well, this person just ripped me up and said that my <laughs> stuff was yeah. terrible. And then in some ways it might be hard to like, okay, well, I'm going to go start a second batch. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's like a catch between two. You want people around you who are going to, of course, be honest. But if you get poor feedback, a feedback you don't want to hear necessarily, don't think it's the end of the world i mean yeah. i i i probably i i mean i'm uh i don't want to say ambitious i'm uh tunnel visioned enough to want to try again like i would mm-hmm. i would just keep going mm-hmm. but i don't think everybody's in that same mindset so just keep going yeah yeah and that's that's the thing i would say is it's it's great to perfect a recipe i get a lot of joy out of getting into my like fourth or fifth batch where i'm like just turning the balance dials a little bit uh-huh. like from the last batch. But also, especially as a new brewer, it's also okay to just go wild. You know, brew a little bit of everything mm-hmm. and and give it all away and really get that feedback and experience all those different styles as a way to like expand your mind and expand your palate around what mead can be. Yeah. Because as if you if you're only doing melomels, if you're like, sorry, I do boysenberry and blackberry and blueberry, and those are the that's what I play uh-huh. with, then you're never gonna get to experience a, a great capsicumel or a great acer glen or something that's that's for one, not really commercially available mm-hmm. and for two, that's totally outside of your comfort zone of playing with honey and berries. Right. I think well, so I, in my brain, I've been watching this show called Ink Masters. I don't know if you've ever seen it before. It's like a tattoo show? Yeah, it's a tattoo okay. show. It's probably from like 2009 or something like yeah, that. Yeah. But there's all these people. Of course, tattooing is its own art. And there are different styles. You know, there are people who do more cartoony stuff. There are people who do realist, realistic. I don't know all the styles. But a bunch of different styles. And so on this show, there's these people, or you know, some guys are like, I'm really good at cartoon whatever kind of stuff yeah and then they go to a competition and they have to do something that's not cartoon and then they go well if i was given a cartoon one i'd be really good. <laughs> oh yeah that yeah. kind of made me think i i feel like the best mazers in the world are the ones who can 
do a little bit of everything. Mm-hmm. Like, of course, you can make a one really good meat recipe, but um, I don't know that one mastering one recipe is gonna make you the one of the best. Yeah. In the world, being able to do your traditionals and mellow mels really well, and oh, I can use uh, peppers and do capsicum mels and do like all these things really rounds you out. Yeah. So if you want to be a, in my opinion, a, a rounded mead maker. You will experiment in lots of different ways. Yeah. Also, yeah. I just think it's more fun. I mean, I mean, it goes back to what you were saying earlier about balance. Is being able to be a really exceptional mazer is having a great palate and a great mind for balance and for honey retention. Mm-hmm. Because if you can do both of those things, regardless of style, uh-huh. then you are very skilled at right. this craft. In a honey balance is not sweetness. Right. I think right. that's a big thing here. Is a lot of people will say like, well, the honey balance is nice because it tastes sweet. <laughs> right. Those are not not equitable. I mean, Mead Stampede, yeah. our, our best of show was a dry traditional. Mm-hmm. Which, if you think <laughs> about that, like, even in my own world, trying to do traditionals, like, drying out a traditional mead can be really sketchy. Yeah. Because, like... You're depending so much on the floral mm-hmm. side of the honey, mm-hmm. and it's it's tough. So, I, I think that's important too to note. Sweetness is not, or sorry, uh, uh, honey presence is not sweetness. Right. That but that boils down to getting high quality honey, mm-hmm. high quality ingredients. Just making sure you're you're presenting with the nice products. You know, mm-hmm. I, I think good ingredients in more often will lead to good product out. Not always, yeah. but. If you just go and buy honey bear honey, or, you know KFC honey packets, <laughs> yeah, honey packets, <laughs> and you know start start squeezing them into a bucket, like yeah. you're gonna you're gonna get a product. But you'll have something. Yeah, <laughs> you'll have something. I want to wanna try this at some point, but I don't know that uh, it'll be a gag. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. YouTube short. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I I agree. Like input is is really going to determine your output Mm -hmm. as far as um ingredients but again that like that balance wheel of understanding you know maybe doing bench trials maybe you've done a three gallon batch and you pour a bunch of one ounce tasters and you play with acid tannin in each of them to figure out what works for that honey profile yeah too and then on top of that start layering in sweetness to determine how that's going to play because you're right, it is tough to do a traditional. Mm-hmm. And if you've got one big whack at it where you've spent a bunch of money on honey mm-hmm. to do a really big, exceptional batch, and you taste it in secondary and you're like, oh, this is unbalanced, you don't want to necessarily balance the whole batch. Right. You want to kind of play with it and figure out what works before you start making additions. Yeah, don't don't just start pitching in <laughs> uh, acid blends and, and stuff like that. Yeah. I just... And I, who is it that was... It might have been you or somebody was talking about that was, you know, take 10 glasses and mm-hmm. then take a little pinch of malic acid and take mm-hmm. a little pinch of tartaric and like, you know, just go in each glass and just and, and keep doing little ratios until you find what works best. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, psychotic. I mean, I don't know if there's a better word to say it, but like <laughs> uh, you, you have to be a little bit psychotic in, to get a, a, a recipe mastered. It, I know that sounds bad, but what I mean you're is talking like, about me right now. Uh, it requires in a, gra- a, in a good way. I it think requires that, a certain level of obsession. Yeah, I'll say ob- that. obsessive. Maybe that's a better word. <laughs> Psychotic has some other notions to it. Uh, I do get uh, you know my butter beer recipe is a good example of one that I just I did. I went a little bit off the deep end. Mm-hmm. Like I got I. Like, you might have found me, like, in the corner of a padded room, like, writing out what my next recipe was going to be in the corner with, like, charcoal. But, like, there's a certain pleasure to that, too, when you when you nail it and you brew it identically the next time and it comes out identically yeah. and it's perfect. There's something really rewarding about that. I also totally understand the people who want to brew something completely different every single time and yeah. and say recipes are for the birds, you know. No, I think recipes are very important and developing your own is also very important. Workshopping others uh, is is important too. But at the end of the day, I think what we all have to do is is develop your palate in one way or another. Mm-hmm. And whether that is to 
go and buy a bunch of commercial meat, which is never a bad thing for us mead world people to no. support uh, commercial meat makers, mm -hmm. or to go make a bunch yourself. Your your best course of action to get better at it is to try new things. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the whole mead stampede experience of just trying other people's <laughs> stuff was super valuable for me because oh, I got yeah. to taste test like some amazing stuff that I'm like, how the heck did they do that? Yeah, it was really eye opening. And and because it made me, I mean, in a way, it kind of makes you feel small because you're like, holy crap! Like somebody, yeah. somebody did this, and you know, and I, trusted us with it. Yeah, and, and, <laughs> you know? and said, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so it's yeah. uh, it's pretty crazy, but don't be afraid to try new things. Just just try try stuff. Yeah. Honey's expensive. Don't <laughs> obviously throw things away. That's not the point. But I think unless you try. You never know. Yeah, I'm all about experimentation. Yeah. <laughs> Go so for it. I got one last thing, okay, and then we'll end this episode. I want to know. This will be out in probably a couple weeks from this moment we're recording. Is there anything on your channel that we should be looking out for in the near future? <laughs> I wish you would ask me this a week ago. Um, I just put out a video, or I guess past stuff that you'd like yeah. to promote too. In the past. No, I, I just put out a video on how to write your own recipe mm -hmm. that I think is really valuable content. I took a hard look at my process and made a huge... I don't often script my videos, but I really scripted this one out because mm -hmm. I wanted to hit every touchstone point. And um, I don't know if you've seen it yet, but it's, it's a lot. <laughs> it is a very intense video. Mm -hmm. uh, it's... There's... There's... There's moments where you might hit the pause button and just breathe a little bit, because it is it is it is dense. Yeah. Um, so I'm really proud of that one. Uh, we've got a video coming up this week actually on uh, one of the most popular recipes for my channel. Hmm? We're revisiting it and looking at it through a beginner lens on how you could adapt it hmm? for your own purposes, and it's a beginner braggot, which okay. I feel like mead makers don't do a lot of braggots because mm -hmm. it's scary. Right. Grains, mashes hops that's that's and, somebody else's playground mm -hmm. right and honey and beer can mix in weird ways they can interesting ways they it sometimes the malt can obliterate your honey sometimes the honey can totally dry out your mm -hmm. malt profile and so uh it's an interesting video because we're taking a recipe that i've brewed i don't know 10 12 times mm -hmm. and talking about how it can be used for a beginner to kind of play around with their own braggot recipe mm -hmm. so looking forward to that Great. Well, BC, thank you for coming on. Um, thank you for sharing. Of course. I love getting to share this stuff. I'm sorry. I, I don't feel like I pulled out anything that was fan fantastic. In fact, I pulled out stuff that was arguably not fantastic for this series. Meh. So It is what it is. I, uh, I think it's an interesting exercise to taste through yeah. some stuff that's average, even after years of age, yeah. and, uh, and kind of assess it through a different lens. Absolutely. Well, we have some, some series together, too, other than this podcast. He's been on, you can find episode 21 of this podcast with BC on it as well. Um, but we have we have some interesting ones. We have uh -huh. one called Palette Expanders, which is where we bring uh, two meads or beverages to each other, I guess, and uh, taste test them pretty much blind, not telling each other what we brought. Mm -hmm. And uh, that always ends in... Um, <laughs> in, in fun ways shenanigans you know, yeah there's always interesting stuff there <laughs> um, and then we have one called mead swap which is where we take and we uh, provide ingredients and then we swap back and forth at each stage of the mead so somebody starts it somebody does something after the primary so someone does something in the secondary and then we come back together and and we see what happened and yeah. again we don't tell each other what happened so it becomes a kind of a game to it is. In a way it's to a, stump each other. It's a bit of a guess. Yeah, it's it's both, I want to stump you, but I also want to improve it at every step. Yeah. And so it's it's a real interesting exercise of like, what can I do to make this better? But I also want to do something that he can't guess. Yeah, yeah. because if you just throw like, whatever, blueberries in, you yeah. know, then it's like, oh, that tastes like blueberries. So, right. Right. You know, I think there's, obviously we, we do what we want on it, but it's a lot of fun. So check out those series. Mm -hmm. Check out BC's channel. It'll be down, down in the description. If you're listening on podcast things, it'll be down in that description as well. Um, make sure you go and support him and his YouTube channel. Of course, check out the videos he's referring to because 
I think everybody needs to develop their recipes a little better or learn how to develop a recipe for that matter. <laughs> recipe development is really important, but if you don't want to use a recipe, that's your prerogative. That's Those are the same people who don't want to use a hydrometer. <laughs> <laughs> you said that, not me. <laughs> So, thank you for uh, <laughs> listening or watching. We will be back with some other um, content. Uh, this is not the last time BC will be on this podcast. You know, we'll see. Every, we kind of check up every year, year or so. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back about once a year and do one of these. Kind of yeah. what's happened <laughs> we'll look since back then. On a year of me. Yeah, maybe next time it will just be a look back on yeah. what happened. But We can just talk about the last two episodes <laughs> we did together. Do you yeah. remember the time we talked about... <laughs> This has been episode 35. Uh, we'll catch you guys another time. Cheers. Cheers. and see what episode I'm on because I can't remember. I'm on 35 now. So this is the podcast. Yeah, right? this is the okay. podcast. You're what, on 21. What's new way. with Mead? Yeah, what's new, what's new with Mead? You're on 14 episodes ago, which was like, doesn't seem like that's like a year ago. ago. It's been a year or so. Over... Holy smokes. Yeah, it's been a long time. It's been so long. Yeah.